Well, are you ready to come to know Jesus in a deeper way? Are you ready to grow in your faith and come to understand and know your Bible better? If so, then this series that we are beginning today on the Exodus is a great place for you. Because the things that we learn in the New Testament about Jesus and the, the kingdom of God unfolding, they have their roots in the Old Testament, and much of it is in the book of Exodus that we'll be studying. My goal today is just to introduce you to this wonderful book of the Bible. So this whole sermon will really be an extended introduction to the book of Exodus. And I'll try to set the stage for the rest of the series that we'll be going through. But before we even get into Exodus, I want to remind you that the Bible is so much more than just a collection of 66 individual books. The Bible ultimately is one book with one story that unfolds through its pages as God reveals himself. So everything that we find in the New Testament has its origins in the Old Testament. Everything is there. And much of it is in the book of Exodus, in seed form, that will blossom later in the scriptures. Jesus says that he is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. And the ultimate proof of this can be seen in something that Jesus said shortly after his resurrection when he's walking along the road to Emmaus with two of his disciples. And the disciples were prevented from knowing who Jesus was by the Spirit, so they don't know who they're talking with. And they're walking along the road and they're talking about some of their doubts and some of their confusions that the tomb was empty. And Jesus broke into the conversation and he said, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So this is a definitive statement by Jesus about the Old Testament. It is about him. All the scriptures are about him. They point to him in the Old Testament. They explain who he is in the New Testament. So as we go through this study of Exodus, never forget who the real hero of the story is. The real hero of the book of Exodus is not Moses. It's God. God is the hero, and we see him on every page of the book. He is the one who reveals himself to Moses in the burning bush and says that he is the great I am. He is the one who will hear the cries of his people in bondage and will send a deliverer to set them free. He is the one who brings plagues on Egypt and divides the Red Sea and drowns Pharaoh's army and provides manna in the wilderness and drink from the rock. He is the one who thunders from the mountain. It is God who enters into a covenant with his people and gives the Ten Commandments and leads them by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And by the end of the book, we will see God fill the tabernacle with his glory. We'll see God on every single page of this book. And you will be amazed at how much you learn about Jesus. Exodus explains why Jesus came and why he died the way that he died and even why he died during the time of Passover. All of these things 
or explained in Exodus. So Exodus is not just a story of deliverance. It is the story of deliverance in the Bible. Exodus anticipates this ultimate deliverance that will take place in Jesus Christ. It's all there in Exodus. All of the great themes will find their ultimate fulfillment in Jesus. And as we go through this series, we'll make those connections. Here's what was going on in the Old Testament. And here is what this means about Jesus. Here is how he fulfilled it. This is why it matters to you today. That's why I can promise you that as we study these great themes of Exodus, you will come to know Jesus in a deeper way. So if that sounds good to you, then I invite you to join me on this journey through the book of Exodus. Now this morning, I'd like to give you a bit of a roadmap of how we're going to take this journey. Because Exodus is a long book. It's 40 chapters. And because it's such a long book, I'm not going to go through the entire book from front to end in one sermon series. That would take so long, I think we would get a, a little lost along the way. So we'll do part one of Exodus over the next several weeks. And then we'll spend some time in some other parts of Scripture. And then maybe next year sometime we'll come back and we'll jump to part two and we'll work our way through the book over time that way. So just to give you a better idea of the book as a whole, part one of the book is about redemption. This is the story of God's deliverance of his people from slavery in Egypt. The next part of Exodus, from chapters 15 through 18, is about their time of testing in the wilderness. During this section, we'll see that they are journeying out of Egypt and into a time of wondering. Then part three, chapters 19 through 24, are about God's covenant with his people at Sinai and their journey toward the promised land. And finally, in part four of the series, chapters 25 through 40, God gives detailed instructions on how to worship him and what the tabernacle is all about. In this current series, this first series, we'll look at that first part of Exodus and redemption. And we'll stick with the book till we get um, Israel out of Egypt and across the Red Sea. And then we'll do some other things and look forward to the rest of the book down the road. So now that you know a little bit of where we're heading, maybe you won't feel like we're just wandering in the wilderness as we go along here. But it would be easy to get lost in the book of Exodus because Exodus is an epic tale. It's a story and events that took place over 3,000 years ago. And just in the book of Exodus, it covers several centuries of time. It involves two nations, Israel and Egypt, led by two very different kinds of leaders. Moses is called in the Bible the meekest man on the face of the earth. Pharaoh may just be the proudest. But like I said earlier, the book of Exodus isn't really about the human characters, ultimately. It is about God and about God's relationship with his people. It's the story that defines the very existence of the Jewish people. And for Christians, it is nothing short of the gospel in the Old Testament. It's proof that we serve a God who is able to deliver his people from any kind of bondage. <clears throat> also, it's important to recognize that the book of Exodus 
is a sequel to the book of Genesis. It picks up where Genesis left off. In Exodus 1, 1 through 5, it says, These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan and Naphtali, Gad and Asher. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. Exodus begins the way most epic stories begin, right in the middle of things. I mean, Exodus really begins in the middle of a story because if you were to look at the Hebrew text of Exodus, the very first word in Hebrew is the word and. Now, you know if a sentence starts with the word and, it's referring to the previous sentence. Well, the whole book of Exodus starts with the word and. This is a sequel. This is a continuation of a story. Exodus depends on Genesis, and it doesn't make sense without some understanding of Genesis. For example, Exodus provides no explanation for who Joseph is or how he got to Egypt. The author assumes that we already know this. But I don't want to make that kind of assumption You know, pastors are sort of famous for saying, you're all familiar with this text and things like that. Uh, But I try to never say that because I never want to assume that you're familiar with this text. Because at Christ Community Church, we want this to be a place where you can come with no knowledge of the Bible whatsoever. Because we love teaching the Bible. We spend time teaching the Bible and helping you understand from the ground up what the Bible is talking about. That's why Adam's doing this class coming up on understanding the Bible. That's why we take 30 to 40 minutes during the the worship time to have a sermon so we have time to dig deep into the Word of God. We, We count that a privilege. So if you're here and you're new to the Bible, or you're not familiar with Genesis, or maybe you just need a refresher on the book of Genesis, I want to do a one to two minute overview on the book of Genesis, just so you see where it connects with Exodus. At the heart of Genesis is a promise. It's a promise that God made to Abraham that he would become a great nation. And it's a promise that would be carried on through Abraham's descendants, through his son Isaac and his grandson Jacob, and his children, 12 sons, who would become the 12 tribes of Israel. One of those sons was Joseph. And Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers in a fit of jealous rage. But in Genesis 50, verse 20, we learn that what Joseph's brothers had intended for evil, God intended for good. And God used even the horrors of Joseph's slavery and eventually raised him up to the position of prince of Egypt, where he was in charge of basically everything that was happening in the country. And God used this because when a severe famine hit the land and Jacob and his family up in Canaan no longer could find food, Jacob sent his other sons down to Egypt to find food. And when they came, Joseph recognized them and he gave them bread and he forgave their sin and they were reconciled. And this began a relocation project where God moved Jacob's whole family from Canaan down to an area of the Nile Delta. And while Jacob's family was in Egypt, God kept the promise that he had made to Abraham. And Israel 
grew as a people. They were blessed and they multiplied. And verse 6 gives us the setting for the book of Exodus. Then Joseph died. And all his brothers and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. Hundreds of years had passed since God made that first promise and even since Joseph first entered Egypt. But this small family was becoming a nation. They were flourishing as a people and God was blessing them. But the story turns in verse 8. Every epic story has a turn like this. And that's true in what actually happened with God's people. In verse 8, Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And this new king said, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. So this remarkable growth of the Jewish people became the basis for the xenophobia of the Egyptian king. And with no provocation whatsoever, and without any justification, Pharaoh made Israel out to be a threat. And he stirred up the sentiment of the people that they would believe that this immigrant population is a threat not just to the Egyptian king, but to all the people of Egypt. And so Israel's experience in Egypt would turn from an experience of prosperity to a time of great persecution. And it would continue to intensify. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. The heavy burden and the persecution and the oppression that had been intended to suppress the growth of the Jews created actually quite the opposite. They kept flourishing. The more the Egyptians oppressed them, the more the Israelites grew as a people. And here we learn an important lesson that we'll see throughout the book of Exodus. God's plans will not be thwarted by human efforts. God's plans will not be thwarted by human efforts to oppose him. It's a lesson that Pharaoh and everybody who opposes God will eventually learn. But Pharaoh hasn't learned it yet, and his persecution efforts will only ramp up. Verse 13. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work 
as slaves. Pharaoh thought this was the ultimate political solution. He would solve his labor shortage problem with all this free labor, but at the same time, he would solve this immigration problem and this growing threat of the Jewish people by trying to crush them into submission so that they couldn't rise against him. But we learn, even in these early chapters of Exodus, that any attack against God's people is an attack against God himself. And Pharaoh would soon experience the futility and the misery of trying to oppose the living God. Now, if you're here this morning and you're a person who has been standing in opposition to God, you need to know that there is no path forward for you except a path of misery and hopelessness and futility if you continue to oppose God. So in this series on Exodus, I really hope and pray that God would grab hold of your heart and that you would see that there's a really clear choice all throughout the Bible to either follow God and be one of his people or to stand in opposition to him. And I hope you will see what happens with Pharaoh as a solemn warning to those who stand against God. Let him soften your heart and draw you to himself. There's no other good path. Well, Pharaoh never did soften his heart. And we will learn that the results of standing against God and fighting against God are always catastrophic. In this world and ultimately in the next, don't fight against God. Well, Pharaoh would become an obstacle to God's plan because God's plan was to bring his people up to the promised land. In Genesis, Joseph prophesied to his brothers, God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And we will see that God does indeed bring his people up out of Egypt and to the promised land. But there is a lot of suffering in the process. And here too we learn some great lessons for the Christian life. For, for living in this world. It's one of the themes that we'll see throughout Exodus. The theme of suffering. One of the questions that is raised in this book is why do God's people have to suffer so much? Why? We'll talk about this in more detail starting in two weeks from today in our next message in this series. But I want to say a few words here just in the introduction to the book, a few words about suffering. First, in Exodus we see that suffering is not caused by God. It is caused by by sin. There will be no suffering in heaven. There was no suffering before sin entered into the world. All of our suffering can be traced back to the fact that we are living, living in a fallen and broken world. That's why there's suffering. Suffering. 
Israel suffered, not because of what God did, but because of what Pharaoh did in enslaving them. Second, suffering is always redeemable. Pharaoh meant to harm God's people. He meant it as evil, but he actually was used, even in his evil plans, to help bring about God's purposes. He helped to preserve the identity of God's people through the very suffering that they had to endure. And the more Pharaoh oppressed God's people, the more they prospered. And that is always true in the Bible. Our God is able to redeem suffering, and he actually uses it to accomplish his purposes in our lives and out there in the world. We'll see that really clearly in this book. Third, suffering never impedes God's plans. Never. It's intended to, but it doesn't do it. It doesn't work. The next phase of God's overarching plan for his people was to bring them into the promised land. And there was nothing that the most powerful man on the face of the earth could do to thwart God's plans. Nothing. And this should give us great confidence as God's people. Because we live in the midst of this fallen world and we know that there's an enemy and sometimes we see very clearly the way he's working to try to defeat God's plans. Even to defeat God's plans for this church, right? We, we see his hand at work trying to destroy even the church. But we have great confidence because God's plans cannot be stopped by the evil intents um, of the enemy. God is so big that he's able to take even what is intended for evil and use it to accomplish his purposes. Just think about the story of God's people going out of Egypt and into the promised land. God's plan was to take them to the promised land. Egypt was never intended to be the promised land. But there is no way at that moment, during their prosperity, before the persecution came, there's no way that the people of Israel would have wanted to leave Egypt. They came there in famine and as 70 people, and they had flourished and grown and multiplied. They prospered in Egypt. There's no way they would have wanted to leave on their own. Egypt was the only home that they had ever known for generations. It took extreme suffering and the bondage of slavery to make God's people cry out for deliverance. And even then, we'll see when we get to the story that it was hard to get them to leave. And even once they left, sometimes they wanted to go back. <laughs> it took suffering. And God used it to bring about his greater purposes. And we'll see that in this series. I think that'll be very helpful to us. One scholar said, in order to cut loose the bonds that bound them to Egypt, the sharp knife of affliction must be used. And Pharaoh, though he knew it not, was God's instrument in weaning them from the Egyptian world. So evil and suffering never impede God's plan. Quite the contrary. God uses them to accomplish his purposes. And finally, suffering helps us to appreciate God's grace. God calls us to remember. Remember. 
after they were released, God made sure that his people would always remember the suffering that they had endured. Years later, he would give them instructions that every year they were to eat the bitter herbs and remember the years of bitter slavery. God did that because he wanted them to remember so that they would also remember the grace that he gave them in delivering them. And all of these themes that we've seen just in this introduction are themes that uh, we will talk through as we, as we get into this series and we'll see in, in greater depth and especially we'll see in the connection with what happens when Jesus comes in the New Testament. But I want to close here today with one more thing by way of introduction to this book. Why is the book called Exodus? Ancient books weren't given titles the way that books are today. The writer didn't start with the scroll and write Exodus in big letters across the top and then write out the book of Exodus. The title to the book of Exodus actually wasn't given for maybe 700 to 1,000 years after the book was written. So why Exodus? The title actually comes from Exodus 19 verse 1. On the third new moon after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt. The word gone out is the word that's translated exodus. Exodus is a story of going out. It's a story of departure. It's a story of leaving a place of bondage and slavery and going to a place of freedom and deliverance. It was God's plan to take his people out of Egypt and into the fulfillment of the promised land. The theme of getting out of Egypt would be a major theme that would show up after the Exodus all throughout the rest of the Old Testament. When God established the Feast of Unleavened Bread, he says to, they are to tell their children, for with a strong hand, the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. That expression, out of Egypt, occurs 114 times in the Bible in the Old Testament. The story of the Exodus, of coming out of Egypt, is the story that Jewish parents were to tell their children and their children and their children's children on down through the generations. God wants his people to understand this story. Because in the end, this story is a story about knowing God. And what it takes to be delivered from sin and to be found in a relationship with God. All throughout Exodus, we see... God revealing himself to people. God appears to Moses in the fire. He appears in the cloud of glory on the Mount Sinai. This book is about God revealing himself. And all along, it is anticipating a greater exodus that is to come, that we are still awaiting. The complete restoration, the ultimate going out, the ultimate exodus will be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And the rest of the Bible, in a sense, is an extended interpretation on the book of Exodus. So as we study this book, we'll see that Israel's journey is a parallel to our own spiritual pilgrimage. We will learn about our journey, the process that brought Israel into a relationship with God is the paradigm for understanding the gospel message. The Exodus was meant to be remembered, not just by the Jewish people, 
but by everybody who stands in that promise. We are part of that history. And God has made us with a need to remember these kinds of things. That's why he made all those feasts and festivals in the Old Testament that we would remember. That's why he established the ordinance of the Lord's Supper that we celebrated this morning, that we would remember. We tend to forget things. And God calls us to remember, remember. He wants us to remember because this story of the Exodus is how salvation happens in the Bible. Israel was in the bondage of slavery and needed a a savior to come and deliver them. Through Moses, God said to Pharaoh, let my people go. And if you're a believer, that's what happened in your life. We needed exactly what they needed. We needed a savior to come along. And God sent us a second Moses. And he includes us in a greater exodus. We need a, a, deliver, a, a liberator to come along and free us from slavery and destroy the enemies that held us captive. We needed a hero to come along and say to the enemy, let my people go. We needed a provider to come and care for us, to feed us manna from heaven and water from the rock. We needed someone to lead us by day and to lead us by night. We needed someone who would bring us into the ultimate promised land where we would live with him forever and ever. We needed a deliverer, and boy, did he send us one. And that's why I can promise you, you will learn so much about Jesus as we go through this book of Exodus. Let's pray to him as we close. Lord Jesus, you are the great deliverer. You have come and you have set your people free from bondage. Every bit is real and every bit as much as you have set your people free from slavery in Egypt, you have delivered us from the bondage of sin and you have brought us into your kingdom. And there is a promised land awaiting for us, an ultimate place in your perfect eternal kingdom Lord, we stand in this promise that's seen all throughout Scripture. And Lord, I pray that in this study of Exodus, we will come to understand this promise better. We will come to know you more deeply, and we will come to love you. Lord, help us to really love you as we understand better what you have done for us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.